kind of <clears throat> kind of glad that it uh, wasn't working. You can't always prepare your sermon props the way God can. He's good at what he does. So, a little bit interesting this morning because there's a lot of people here that I don't know. And I would just say this, that I don't really think you had anything to do with you being here today. I don't really think you had any, any, any part of that. I think that the Bible is true, and I think that the Bible says, well, I don't think it, I know it, it says that God places us together perfectly. And as each person does their own special work, it helps the others to grow, and then the whole church is healthy, growing, and full of love. I believe that God put you in this seat today. It was not your call. It was his. Bow to him. Surrender. Wave your white flag. Just give in and stop thinking you're that cool because you're not. I'm not. You're not. None of us are. He's in charge. Don't call him sovereign unless you believe it. <coughs> so the reason why it's weird that there's a lot of new people in here is because you're coming in and you're here and you're kind of checking out a church that you've never been to. Well, lucky you. You just walked into a weird situation. <coughs> and I just tell you that the people in this church, maybe that's why it's not so full, but maybe the maybe it's beautiful. I don't know how it all works out. But everyone in this church, they li- they like genuine. They like real. And so I say that because I'm about to say some things that you may not like, and I honestly couldn't care less. So I just think it's time in church to stop sugarcoating and pretending that I'm some Yoda up here, and I'm going to have everything, every answer for you that you need, because I don't. I'm a human being, and I have emotions and feelings just like all of you, and I go through some things too, and the reason why I'm saying that is because, like I touched on a a few moments ago, um, I wanted to call service off last night, and you think, well, why would you want to do that? (coughs) So let me just tell you why. And before I say, I just want to tell you that I'm not going to be short. So if you need, if this isn't important, you can go now. That's okay. You won't hurt anybody's feelings. <coughs> I want to take you back, and um, I want to take you w- w- way, way, way far back, and um, and tell you why I wanted to cancel church last night. So I've been, this church has been in existence for eight years, and for six and a half we played church. And I'm not trying to offend anybody that used to be here, whatever, but it was a social club at what was SNL Church, now Revolution Church. It was a social club. Everybody liked everybody, and we get around, we have a good time. We had a cool band that sounded good. There was no worship. There was no praise. We threw junk at God. You had to pull teeth to get people to do anything. They wouldn't show up half the time. It was just a, it was just a joke. You know what I'm saying? It was a joke. <coughs> but here's the thing. I wasn't, I wasn't saved for that kind of church. And I wasn't called to plant that kind of church, okay? So, so <coughs> yesterday, the reason why I was so frustrated is because this church that God has planted here and provided for this 10,000 square feet in the middle of the highest traffic area in town where there was no church, so, like, obviously he wants to get something done. Would you agree? Like, we didn't have any money, and there was less people in this church than sitting in this room right now when we moved here. So we had no chance, but he supernaturally provided for everything that you see and you sit on and you hear. And he wants to get something done, right? (coughs) And so he put us here to do something. Well, that's not just my job. It's all of our jobs. When he places you here, it's so that each of us does our own special work to help this thing happen, right? So last night I got, yesterday I got here for an 11.30 meeting with uh, Carlos and Alicia, and I got here and I realized that the coffee bar they were all so gung-ho about and we were going to reach the world with and we were going to be here as an evangelistic tool and a way to serve our community. We're going to be available to our community and be able to have gospel opportunities to share with the people. I got here and I realized that it hadn't opened in the morning, and of course, you know, it hadn't opened in the morning because Mimi, my mother-in-law, was supposed to be doing that shift, but not to draw attention off, but her mom, Granny, that most of you know, she passed this morning, so that was kind of a bummer, but she's been obviously busy, you know, I mean, Mimi's been 24-7 with Granny, so she couldn't be here, legit excuse, right, and nobody filled in, and then the one to five person that was supposed to be here, no show, so I get here, and when I got here, 
A little while later, this lovely young lady was here with her grandkids, and she said, well, sh we got here earlier, and when we got here earlier for coffee, the place was closed. And there was a bunch of people sitting outside on your benches. I was like, epic failure. We failed. So there was that. It's like, hmm, I feel really alone right now. Like, nobody's helping. We're a church. We're a family. <coughs> then I got inside, and as the day went on, started turning on the sound stuff to get ready for the service. And there's this massive buzz going through the system, and we couldn't get rid of it. No matter what we did, you'd hear it. It was a lot worse yesterday. I don't know what was going on, and I don't know what's going on with it. We've only been chasing, chasing it for six months. But I was a little frustrated because I couldn't get any microphones to work, and Tom was on his keyboard. We couldn't get that to work, and it was going, eh. His keyboard was going, eh, through my channel. Like, I don't understand all that. And I was frustrated, not because of that, but because the person who was an electrician in our church that told me, I'll be back after the service three weeks ago. After the service, I'll be back. I'm going to go get lunch. I'll be back, and I'll fix this problem. It doesn't need to be that way. I'm still waiting on him. And then, after that, total honesty in church. You guys allow me to do this, right? So I'm about to pick on you, but I love you, and we've already talked about it. Can I do it? You cool? Okay. Tori and Ryan run our Facebook broadcast. And on the last, kind of a last minute notice, they decided they weren't going to be here last night, and they asked somebody else to fill in for them who could not be here in time to do that. It takes about 20 minutes to set it all up. So we had no Facebook broadcast. And I'm thinking of all the people that are now watching it every single week online, and they actually treat it like their church service because they don't live in this area. They live out of state. They didn't get to be a part of what we did last night. Pretty disappointed about that, too. And then my wife, who's sick as a dog, she had to go back there and watch the kids last night because the person who's on the schedule and has had the schedule for three months, when my, my wife sent out the text, hey, you guys ready for this weekend? It's going to be great. We're going to teach the kids. And Oh, I didn't know I was teaching. Really? You're 35 years old. You've had the schedule for three months in front of you in print. You don't remember? Would you do that with your job? So she's back there watching kids sick as a dog. And again this morning, doing the same thing. Because the teachers who said they were going to do something didn't. And then the person who's supposed to be here to check in children, supposed to be in place at 530 for our children that we want to receive. We want our church filled with families and kids, right? We do. Except our children's check-in wasn't available till 10 till. So we had no way to check in children. Two weekend, uh, last weekend, Pastor Jay got up and shared with you the Great Commission. And part of that message was a strong call to not more theology, but more character. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Okay? And, and the reason I'm saying that is because we all, I get up here and, and whoever's up preaching, we talk about let's do this for Jesus and let's see his kingdom come and let's see the people come to the altar and get saved and get baptized and change their life and let's have an awesome church that's going to change the world. But except, I'm picking, but... Y'all really don't want that. You say you do, but actions speak louder than words, yo. <clears throat> I can just tell you that that's not the kind of church that I want to pastor. I'm not walking away. It's just that last night when all this was happening, and then all of a sudden after eight years, it was about eight people here. There's no substitute for presence. You can't build a church sitting at home or in your tree stand, guys. And until the priority of Jesus Christ and his kingdom becomes the priority of your life, it'll never go from vision to reality. And it takes all of us. God places us together perfectly. And as each person does their own special work, it helps the others to grow. I'm reminded of a, of a book, maybe some of you read it, called The Circle Maker. Anyone read The Circle Maker by Mark Batterson? Anybody? One person? One person. It's a great story. He's the pastor of National Community Church in Washington, D.C. He read, he wrote this book, and it was based on this. Uh, I don't know if it's true or not, but it's in Jewish tradition, Talmud stuff. It's this guy, Hani, the circle maker. Hani was a, 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 an Old Testament, way, way back in, in the Old Testament days, Hebrew prophet, and, and the nation of Israel had been delivered from Egypt, and 
you know, is for God's name's sake, because if they all die and he gets delivered, you get to deliver them from Egypt and then they all die in the desert, that's kind of a waste and that's not much fame for God, right? So, so they're, they're, they've been delivered, but there's now been a drought for years and years and people are dying because there's no plants. There's no crop they can't eat. And so one day he walks out of his tent and he's feeling very, very inspired and moved and he gets out and he goes out into the sand and takes his staff and he makes a circle in the, sa- in the sand. And he doesn't leave that circle ever. And he says, God, you delivered us from Egypt only to die in the desert. What fame is that going to bring you? And so, Lord, I'm not leaving this circle until you bring the rain that we need to be sustained. That's bold, isn't it? Telling God what to do. And all of a sudden, it began to drizzle. And some people would say, well, praise God, it's drizzling, it's raining, it's raining. And Hani said, no, 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 that's not enough. God, that is not the rain that I prayed for. I prayed for a sustaining rain that would bring crop and life to your people for your namesake. And then it began to pour. And some people would say, that's awesome, except when, you, when it pours on land that hasn't rained in a long time, right? Where's it going? Flooding and falling off into the ditches no plants no sustaining and he stood in the circle still while it was pouring and said god i did not pray for such a rain you promised to deliver your people and take care of us and that's the rain that i'm calling you to and all of a sudden the rain slowed down and it's it was a nice steady earth soaking in plant producing rain i say that because i feel like that guy When Jesus Christ saved me and ripped me out of dead religion and the American dream and brought me into his kingdom, and I realized that he was whipped and beaten and spit on and mocked and killed for me, that does not have any room for complacency or lethargy in any of you or any of me. Nothing. None of us are allowed that. You're not allowed to treat Jesus that way. And that I don't want to pastor a church that's playing games. We're either going to be all in and give ourselves completely to him and his mission, or I'm out the door. I don't want to play games anymore. And I pray that you receive that. I'm not here to rip you. I love you. And I love him. And when I was told to plant the church by him, it was to make a movement that would bring the people. I'm Moses, right? So I'm letting you into my little crazy little world. I'm Moses. And my mom said the, that the world needed another Moses. That's why we called you that. And I realized after being here in Florida that the people that love Jesus didn't have someone with a backbone who would stand up for him and lead him into the promised land. And that's the church he told me to plant. And so I'm just asking you to consider going all in for him and, and advancing his kingdom and letting aside all the excuses and the complacency that we all are victim to. That's the church in this country, and it's pathetic and weak. (coughs) Just needed to let you guys know that. So I was ready to call it last night. After eight years walking into a room and all the people that said, oh, I love that church, I love that, I love it, and they're sitting at home or doing whatever they're doing, but they ain't here. And you know, I... I'm no different than you guys. If you started a company and it wasn't going good, you started a marriage and it wasn't going good, you'd get bummed out, right? I was totally bummed out last night. I said to Pastor Jay, and I told Ramon, and I told Patty, I said, well, we're just going to cancel that and, and tell everyone to come in on Sunday morning, and maybe some of you guys would be here, and we'd have, we'd have a service. And we prayed, and, and, and Ramon said, go ahead and work. Just go worship. Fight your battle. Go win. So I did. I went back there, and I did my thing, and he gave me the strength to get up and rip everybody a new one, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> sorry, and, um, and I realized that while I was sitting back there <coughs> singing to Jesus, that if I cancel, then I'm doing the exact same thing that I'm telling you not to do. I realized that that my definition of, of, of success had changed a while back, but I had slipped back into old definition. My old definition would have insisted on a full room. 
but my new and I think more accurate definition of success is obedience. And he told me 15 years ago, go tell people about me and use that book. It's the only thing I've ever heard. And so I realized I just need to get up there and do that. I don't care if there's a thousand people in this room or one. I have to do my job. And so through his strength and the prayers of my dear brothers and the encouragement of a sister, I got up and I was able to uh, share God's word, and I'd like to do that with you this morning, if that's okay. All right. So, why don't you open your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 13, and um, I just want to say that we've been going through uh, Matthew chapter 5 and 6 and 7, we've been, we're just really just beginning chapter 5, but going through a series called uh, Red Wall, Red Letter, and studying the Sermon on the Mount, and, and it's been great, and I'm excited to get back in uh, next, week. next week. Speaking of next week, I would highly recommend, even though you're here on Sunday, uh, we'll do Sunday next week for sure, but I would highly recommend that you come on Saturday night next week, because next week, our old worship leader and his wife, uh, Kyle and Jamie, and then some of the guys here in the church, uh, g- are going to get together with them, and they're going to have live worship here on Saturday night, and it's going to be a lot more extended time of worship. So if you love to worship God, that would definitely be the time to come, okay? So but if you can't, that's fine. We'll, we'll be here Sunday as well, but I would highly recommend that you're here on Saturday night next week. We'll jump back into Matthew chapter 5 next week as well, but this week, um, I, uh, pardon me. God has uh, met me in a variety of different ways over these last couple of weeks, and uh, I kind of landed in Matthew chapter 13, and and he spoke to me pretty clearly and powerfully in Matthew chapter 13, and if uh, God gives shepherds after his own heart to his church, uh, then I have to love you the way he loved on me, and as he brought me to a green pasture, I want to bring you to a green pasture, and that green pasture is in Matthew 13, uh, verses 31 and 32. We're going to read that in just a moment. And so I want to share that with you. It's been highly impacting to me. But um, leading up to that, I just want to say that uh, part of this message came to me while I was in Chicago. Chicago was a great time. Myself and Nick and Tom and Pastor Ramon went to Harvest Bible Chapel for the Vertical Church Conference. And uh, it was an amazing, amazing uh, two and a half days there. Uh, We ended up having more than that. We ended up going to uh, our old worship leader, Kyle, his church. They were having a worship night on on Saturday night. They had another worship night on Sunday night. They had their worship service on Sunday morning, and it was just an awesome, awesome week being poured into. Like some of the greatest teachers on the planet, uh, Matt Chandler, Ravi Zacharias, uh, Christian Barbosa, uh, James McDonald, they were all there, Ed Stetzer, just an amazing, amazing time. And we're in this room with three, nearly 3,000 Jesus freaks, right? These are people that have, that, that it, every, Jesus is everything to them. They've come from all over the world to, to learn and to be poured into so we can have more effective ministries. And there was lots of detail shared uh, from the pulpit. It was awesome. We had all these workshops. We did a workshop on prayer. And, and we need to incorporate that more into our church because that's what Jesus said. He wants our, his house to be a house of prayer. And so we learned that. We talked about small groups in detail and discipling and how to do it. And Because we're here to make, you know, disciples of Jesus, not converts, not fill in the pew. But we want people to follow and love and obey and act just like Jesus. Like that's our task here at the, at the church. And so we were there to get all that stuff. But even though there's great detail and we were very, very informed formed and encouraged and taught in the pulpit, there's a much bigger picture in your seat and in the parking lot. In, in Revelation, I, I think it's like 20, it talks about this, this, this future day coming where, where people from every tribe, tongue, and nation will be around the throne forever, and they'll be worshiping Jesus, and holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come, and we're going to do that for all eternity, and it's going to be awesome, right? But when you're in a room 
with 3,000 people that have literally come from all over the world. And while the band is up playing and you kind of look around and you see this ocean of every tribe, tongue, and nation around the throne singing to him, it's amazing to be in that environment. It was insane. The whole time they're worshiping so passionately. And no matter where you went in the church or in the local restaurants, because we'd all funnel off into restaurants, everyone is just talking about, praying to, centered and focused on, worship offered to one, to Jesus, to our King. Awesome. And the people were just loving each other. You know when you go to a place and someone opens the door for you, but you kind of can tell that they, they're really inconvenienced, but they're just doing it out of obligation? Do you ever feel that when you walk through a door? It's not like that at the Vertical Church Conference. At the conference, you walk in, no matter who you are, you've never met these people before, but they open the door for you. They're not working. They're not the greeters. They're just the people that come from different churches around the world, and they open the door, and you walk through, and they just, hey, how you doing? I'm so glad you're here. Like It's like almost like they're working, and they're not. And then you find yourself opening doors for people and doing the same thing, and you like genuinely love them because they, they're part of your family, and you realize you're, 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 you're part of something so much bigger than this little church in Leesburg. You're part of the kingdom of God. You're part of the kingdom of heaven. It's like, it's so awesome to go and be in that, totally immersed, everyone loving each other. And these people, when you're in this room and you realize that all the people in that room are church planners and pastors and worship leaders and youth leaders, and, and they've given their whole life to Jesus and his mission, it's like, this is awesome. And you want to be part of that. All for him. He's the leader, and he's the example, and he is the reason, and he's the power, and he's the confidence, and ultimately, he is the goal. And you're in this thing, and it was awesome to be there. So many things come to mind. One of them is, I want that for you. I want that so badly for this community. You have no idea. I am so jealous for that, for you. I don't mind going 1,500 miles. We jumped on a plane. It was cool. I'd rather come here and do that. I, I, I just know that part of the whole plan that God has put into my head and said, I want you to do this, is that we would have that here. We would have that here a place where people could go right around the corner and experience the presence and power of God manifesting right here. And you walk in, my sister said, you walk in and you like literally, you've never been here before and you almost like, maybe you would even fall or maybe not, but close and get teeter-tottered. But you'd like, you'd realize God is here. God is here. And you walk in and you just get impacted by that. Like you could, you could almost feel his presence. Like you feel the table or the chair underneath you. That he's not no longer the God of the book who did awesome things back then, but no, he's right here working in and amongst his church here. I want that for you. I want you to want that more than anything in the world. All the th other things that distract you, throw them in the trash where they belong. That is living. That is living. That is what takes the mundane and turns it into an adventure. The presence of God, lives changing, manifesting himself in your presence. Wow, boom, and just passionately in love and, and being loved on by him in church. Not some boring, lame, half-hearted, come once in a while. The most faithful people come three times a month. Are you kidding me? The most faithful volunteers don't come and come in late. Would you come to this church? Let me just ask you all a question. Would you come to this church if I showed up when I wanted to? So what makes you think it's okay for you? <clears throat> that vertical conference was awesome. But it's just a microcosm, just a slice, a sliver, a glimpse of a greater reality. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I want to talk to you about the kingdom of heaven. I want to talk to you about the kingdom of heaven. You know, the kingdom of heaven is mentioned so much in the Bible, but yet it's totally ignored most often. We talk more about the spiritual gifts, which are wrapped up in maybe two to three chapters in the entire Bible. 
We talk more about that than we talk about the kingdom of heaven, which is all through Scripture. We talk about giving and offering and all that stuff more than we do about the kingdom of heaven. We talk about all kinds of stuff that is like hardly mentioned at all in Scripture, but we think it's so awesome and big. The kingdom of heaven is all throughout the Bible. It's everywhere. Here's a, here's a couple. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Matthew 4, 17, Jesus says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Matthew 7, 21, Jesus again, he says, Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I don't know if that verse scares you, but part of this thing that I had last night that I'm sharing with you, this is part of it because the scriptures say that you're supposed to obey your spiritual leaders for they, are, they, they have been charged to care for your soul and they have to give an account for you. And so, so, this, so you call this your church and you come in and you listen to me say these things, but you won't do the things that it says to do. And I wonder how many of you are going to have a bad day on that day. And I don't want any of you to have a bad day on that day. I want that day to be a day you are, you are running towards that day. You can't wait for that day because you know that he's not going to say, who are you? So I just think it's time to just talk openly and honestly in church instead of sugarcoating and getting up here and giving you peppy little happy, you should do this and you should do that stuff and just tell you what it is. You all look like regular folks who can take it, right? This is the deal. Many of you, many of you are going to say, Lord, Lord. And he's going to say, what? Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. There it is again. Matthew 5, 20. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Old Testament experts. The scribes and the Pharisees. Unless your righteousness exceeds theirs, you're not going to enter the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, used synonymously in Scripture. These are the guys that knew the Bible perfectly and performed its duties perfectly. And Jesus said, if your perfect isn't better than perfect, you can't even get in. You need a greater, you need a greater perfect than perfect. And the only thing that's greater than their perfect was Jesus' perfect. And so, gospel, gospel, gospel. Unless you accept what Jesus, the perfect one, did on the cross for you, paying for your sin, you can't get in. That's the gospel. And you just need to say yes to it and believe that it's a real yes. And you get to get in, but the kingdom of heaven is a big deal. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Paul reiterates, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom. Matthew 5, 3, we went over this a couple weeks ago. Blessed are the poor in spirit, or those that realize their need for him. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of heaven is among you. King James would say it's within you. It is. 2 Timothy 4, 1, Jesus will someday judge the living and the dead at his appearing to set up his kingdom. So the kingdom of heaven is kind of a slippery thing. I just need to understand this. It's, 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 look at the words that are used to describe it. It is near. That means it's close. You're almost there. You're almost there. It's close. Then it says those who are poor in spirit, the kingdom is theirs. That's present. That's now, right? But then at the same time, it says someday he's going to set it up. So it's, it's, it's about, it's almost, it is, and it's someday at the same time, right? So this, this someday that the someday that the Bible talks about, like that's exclusive reign. That's the day that's the day that comes where, where there's no rival kingdoms at all. That there's no rogue nations, there's no dark, there's no demonic spirits, there's no Satan. It's Jesus and Jesus only. Look at someone that you love and say, get ready for that day because it's going to be awesome. Come on now, like you love them. That is going to be awesome, and I hope that you're ready for that. And if you're not, you need to get ready right now. No sugarcoating. Get to your knees and surrender. But here's the deal with this. It's going to be awesome. One day he's going to rip open the clouds, and King Jesus is going to come down with his robe dipped in blood and his tattoo on his Lord of Lords and King of— that's my favorite Jesus, cage fighter Jesus. I love that Jesus, right? That's Casper's favorite Jesus. 
I know it, right? But, but, and so that's going to happen. It's going to be this awesome kingdom where he's the only one reigning, and we're going to be with him forever, and it's going to be nothing bad at all. That's going to be awesome, but it's not yet because someday it's going to happen. But here's the thing that's awesome for you right now because none of you in this room are there yet. When Jesus' disciples came to him and said, Jesus, teach us how to pray, he could have said anything. He could have taught them a bunch of different things, but what did he teach them? Pray this way. Y'all know it, right? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Good. What is it? Say it like you mean it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that. Way too many versions in this world. I'm, like, confused right now. Okay, let's boil it down to this. This is going to be awesome someday when he rips open the clouds. We all acknowledge that. We can't wait for that. That's what we're all looking for. But you're not there yet. You're here. And Jesus said, pray like this. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. He didn't ask permission. He looked at his father and said, make this happen, Dad. And he told you to pray just like that. Why? Because Jesus is saying that not the exclusive reign where there's no darkness, but he said, in a sense, what we're going to have up there forever, where it's going to be incredible, that can happen right here, right now. That's what he wants to do. Jesus, the one who is the king of the kingdom, who you're resting on forever, for your eternity, he told you that the kingdom of heaven could be right here, right now. That's what he wants. He told us to pray that way. Where God is obeyed, kingdom. Where God is worshipped, kingdom. Were you singing a little bit ago? Kingdom, right there. Were you singing? You were not singing? Yes. No, I'm just kidding. Were you singing? Kingdom. Where God is obeyed, kingdom. Where God is worshipped, kingdom. Where his pri per perspective is your perspective, where his priorities are your priorities, where, where his things are being practiced, where his ways are being lived. I often say it this way, where, ki where, where Jesus reigns, there his kingdom is. That's it. That's the kingdom of heaven. That's the kingdom of heaven. And so the question is, who or what is wearing the crown over your life? Who are you worshiping? Who are you giving your, your resources to freely, aggressively, often, consistently that is not Jesus and his kingdom? Whose cable bill is more than their offering? Who pays more for cigarettes than their offering? Who's going to football games more than gathering, even though he said, do not neglect the gathering of the saints as some people make a habit of doing? How's your attendance, y'all? <clears throat> I'm speaking honestly to you. I hope you can. Uh, can you guys take it? So, what's what's who's got the crown, man? Who gets most of your attention? Who gets most of your time? Who gets mo most of your thoughts and your wallet and your schedule? All of it. Whatever resource that God has made available to you, who's getting most of that? The kingdom of heaven is huge. It's big. It's most important. A little bit scary at times. But let's just hammer this point down. Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is not some far-off place, off in eternity somewhere, where Jesus is present and Jesus is powerful. He said that could be here right now. He doesn't invade space the way you'd think he would. You need to choose whether this vessel walking around and this vessel walking around and this vessel walking around is going to be kingdom territory. 
or Gator territory or Seminole ter territory or Republican territory or American territory or family territory or your wife's territory or your husband's territory. Whatever it is, your job territory, your money, your house, your cars, whatever it is that you give yourself over to, that's the territory. He said that he's established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. That's big, right? Super big. But once in a while, you get a little, I don't know, whether you're at the beach on a hammock you're up in the mountains next to a little creek that's going by, and it sounds so good, and it's peaceful. Or maybe you look into your brand-new child's eyes, as you have done lately, and you just say, man, this is a little slice of heaven, isn't it? We talk about that, and that's what Jesus is saying, in a sense. Like, you could have this amazingness that's happening in glory right here. You know, in heaven... It's going perfectly well today. Did you know that? You know, the king who, who established heaven, whose throne is over heaven, who's in charge of who gets into heaven, in heaven right now there's angelic beings and beasts and all that revelation stuff that I don't really understand, but if they're all there and they're worshiping him and have been forever and, and they always will. Perfect worship. Like, does anyone in this room think that there's anything in heaven going on right now that God hasn't perfectly illustrated? Jesus Christ is the cruise director. The Father has given him all authority in heaven and in earth. So everything that's happening in heaven right now is exactly as God would want it to happen, right? Would you agree? Everyone? Or just some of you? Okay, well, he said... That it could happen right here. Let your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. Do you take him at his word or does it just sound good? You need to take him at his word. He said that same kind of thing could be happening right here, right now. And it's, But that's kind of mind-blowing. And he wants us to have a slice of heaven right here, right now. So that being said, I want to... I want to read these two verses with you, and I want to explain some of this kingdom of heaven stuff to you. Hopefully, Lord willing, in a way that you understand it and embrace it, and 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 reach forward and grab it, and and it changes your life. Do you think that it could, do you think God's word could change your life? Are you excited to to, to do this? I'm excited to to share it with you. Okay, so here, um, Matthew 13, two verses, 31, 32. Uh, a parable of Jesus. This translation calls it an illustration. Uh, here's another illustration Jesus used. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of garden plants. It grows into a tree. It's like, no, it's not even, Jesus is like, yeah, it grows into a big tree, uh, big, big plant. No, 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 it's actually way, way bigger than that. It's actually a tree. It's a tree in the garden amongst all plants. It's like this. They're all down here. And birds come and make nests in its branches. So, um, When we went up to Chicago, I told you I went to Kyle's main campus for a, um, on Sunday night for a worship night where he had the pastor came in, and he was casting vision and appreciation and leadership to all the volunteers and staff, and there's like 600 people in the room. It's kind of a cool event. We, um, I asked Kyle that afternoon, I said, how long is the service going to be? Just curious. He goes, I don't know, it's slated for about an hour and 20 or so. I said, oh, that's cool. So we got there, and um, the opening music was supposed to be 15 minutes. It went 45. I don't even know how they could do an hour and 20 since the pastor's message was almost an hour. But they did two skits for youth. They did some giveaway on the Internet to all the people. I don't even know how they do all that. The preacher. And then they started singing some more. Y'all think it's loud in here, man, right? We, we run about 80 to 92, 93 decibels. They were like 115, 118. They were killing it, man. It was okay for those 600 people. For Just to let you know, if, you, if it's too loud in here for you, we have air, air plugs out in the lobby there now for you. If you want to use them, you're welcome to it. But the Bible says give it to shout to the Lord, so we're going to shout. <laughs> but um, that band started playing. <coughs> And, and one of the pastors came up on the stage and 
and said, Lord, I just feel like some people need encouragement in this and in this, and some people may have cancer, and we want to pray. We just want to pray with you guys. So come up if you want prayer. And they started coming out of the seats, and they were praying, and we're going to just have some more worship time for a little while, and probably 200 people left. Maybe some of them had a valid excuse, and maybe some of them just felt like they had got their check mark. I don't want to judge. It's not my decision, not my thing to do. I'm not the judge. But they left. I was reminded of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus went up the mountain and the followers didn't follow, but the disciples did. I was thinking about that when all those people left. But that band kept playing. That service went three hours and 20 minutes. And that band played and people came up to the stage and they were being prayed with and prayed for. And then uh, the music was, was killing it and we were and I was just getting at it like crazy and I was exalting my king and I was loving on Jesus and Tell him how great he is, and I had my, my throat was killing me, and we were it was awesome, and everyone was singing, and some people were had their hands to heaven, and they were screaming out to the Lord and telling him how great he is, and some people were being prayed for, and then I oh and I opened up my, my eyes, and some people were in their seats, just in their little war room, right, just by themselves, and they were just praying. They weren't expressing themselves like that, but they were just down like this, and they were praying. And I looked over, and there was some people in different places in the room. There was like a group of people, four, five, six people over there sitting on the floor, and they, had, they were holding hands, and they were just kind of praying for one another. And then over there, there was another group, and over there, there was another group. And, and the people were just broken up into groups. And, and all of a sudden, I just looked, and it dawned on me. I was like, man, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> we were created to worship him. And there we were, all of his people in the presence of their king, bowing down before him, praising him, praying to him, listening to him, trusting him to deliver them from sickness and disease, like all of this happening right before my eyes, and I was so jealous for you. It's like, why aren't we? What, what other thing that you do could be better than that? It put things in perspective for me, like why, why aren't God's people, do, if we were created to worship him, why, why, why aren't we doing that? Why isn't this the rhythm of our life, almost daily, to come and do that, to celebrate and worship our great king? And I wanted that so bad for you, too. And Lord willing, his help, y'all's commitment, we'll see that come to pass. But while I was there, at the, end of the, at the end of the service, they gave out these little things right here. And it was a reminder of what one person can do. There's a mustard seed in here. You probably can't see it because they're really, really teeny. As a matter of fact, my mustard seed, I wore it, and I wore it in my shower, and the water got in it, and it's actually cracked open, and it's growing inside my little glass vial now. So I'm going to plant it outside, and I'm going to grow a mustard, I'm gonna grow a mustard tree. But the mustard seed, I put some pictures up there for you so you can see it because you can't see mine, of course. They're teeny, 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 teeny. Go to the next one. It's a little bit better view. You can see that because of the background. You can actually see it a little bit. But it's like the smallest of seeds. And, and you know, Jesus could have used any seed, really, if he wanted to. But he used a mustard seed on purpose because it's super, 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 super small. And I got this seed, and I was thinking about it this week, like, Compared to, to, we start thinking about the kingdom of heaven where he set up his throne over heaven and, and his rule over all. And I started talking to you a couple weeks ago about this all, this universe. And I talked about the sun, how it's, it's, it's 93 million miles away, this, this sun, this, that's our star. And, it, and, and a million earths could fit inside of it, and it's massive. And, and, to, and just outside our galaxy, where there's hundreds of billions of galaxies, but there's this large Magellanic cloud galaxy, and, and there's 10 billion stars like our star in that one galaxy. And I don't know if this is true because I'm not God, and I'm certainly not a scientist either. They, scientists believe that there's some 40,000 billion stars. And, and when you start thinking about the mustard seed, how little it is, you start thinking about how big everything is, and you hear about all this information about the galaxy, and you realize that the scripture says that all of that that I described to you is but the fringes of his robe, it makes you feel really, really small. Super, super, super small. 
This is massive, and the kingdom of heaven rules over all of that, but somehow, some way, God, although he's ruling over all of that, he's put most of his focus and attention right here on this earth, and all of creation is waiting and groaning for us. This is the battlefield. This is the battleground between good and evil. Right here, King Jesus and his soldiers fighting, pushing back darkness to set up his kingdom. All right here. The whole universe depends on right here. And it's massive, and I'm just this, and this, this, this little salvation that he gave me, and it's just me. I feel small. What could I possibly do to change the universe? Well, when you heard the gospel, when someone faithful shared the gospel with you and Jesus saved you and his Holy Spirit entered you, boom, kingdom territory right there. And that seed got in you. A new seed was sown called a new worldview. And a new seed was sown called grace. And a new seed called love and provision and peace and eternity. It's all in you right then and there when you bent your knee to Jesus. All of that is in you. It's like prego. It's in there. It's better than last night. Last night I told them all that you're all full of it. I'm getting softer. So you see that this seed has been planted inside of you and, and says this mustard seed is planted in a field. When 1 Corinthians 3, 9, you start thinking the field, the field, the field, the field. Oh, Paul talks about that in, the, in, in 1 Corinthians 3, 9. He talks about how there's different people in the kingdom. And some people, like the faithful one who first came up to you and shared the gospel with you, he planted. He got the gospel. Maybe he didn't get saved right away, but then... Two or three years later, he runs into to Bob over here at the flea market, and, and Bob, being the faithful evangelist, he shares the gospel with Matt. Watered, right? Maybe he accepts the, the gospel then and gets saved. That's awesome, but maybe he doesn't. And so later on, he's at, he's at Walmart, and he runs into Tim, and Tim, the fa faithful evangelist that he is, he shares the gospel. Watered. At some point, God brings the increase. We get that. One day, his eyes open up to the truth, and he says, yes, finally. That verse goes on to say, some people plant, some people water, but God brings the increase. You are God's field. He plants this eternity, plants this salvation into you, just little old you, the seed the gospel, the spirit of God planted in little old you, just my salvation, not, not any of the rest of you, just my salvation, little old me, 7 billion people, 40,000 billion stars, but he planted something in me, this little small seed, small, tiny, 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 just little old me versus the kingdom of heaven that's huge. Can we just admit that that's like way too big for you? You think about that, it's way too big. Like, how can I possibly, I can't even, I prayed for five years for my neighbors to come. How, what, am I, what, what influence am I going to have on 40,000 billion stars? And all of the human race, and all evil, and all that, what can I do? How can I be effective in this epic battle of good versus evil and ripping the souls of mankind out of the depths of hell and bringing it into the kingdom of heaven. What can I do? Well, it is too big for you. But the reality is this. That seed that you see up on the screen, there's big in that little. There's massive in that little. Inside of that seed, bring up the trees, is that. It's in that little seed. I don't know what mustard plant Jesus was talking about because there's like three different varieties that grow in the Middle East, so I put on all three pictures just to be safe. But all three of them are pretty big. In our context, if you look out into the parking lot, you see all those big, massive oak trees, and you pick up one acorn, that whole tree with all of its thousands of leaves and all of its thousands of other acorns that it will produce over the years, that's all inside of that little seed already. And that 
is what God has planted inside each and every one of you. You can be big. You can be used for the kingdom of heaven. But you got to do something on your own with the seed. See, a lot of people, they'll quote their favorite Bible verses. They'll say, the one who began a good work will continue to do so until the day of Christ Jesus. That God's spirit produces this kind of fruit in you. Love, patience, kindness, loyalty, you know, whatever. Faithfulness, self-control. Like God does do stuff. I get it. He said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail. But you got to do something with it. You got to do something with that thing. Look, look, not in this version. This version's lame. It says that this small seed becomes the largest. But if you look in other translations, most of them say, but when grown. And don't let your mind slip off into, oh, that means, well, when it gets big. No, 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 no. Wait a minute now. Slow down. When you read the Bible, you got to slow down and think about these things. When a farmer goes out and he plants a crop, whose seed is that? God's, right? Did the farmer create the seed? What does it need to grow? It needs some sun, right? Whose sun is that? Yeah. Whose water is it? True, it's all God's. But doesn't the farmer, I don't know, I've never, any, any farmers in here? No farmers in here, right? Every farmer gets up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I don't even know why they do that, but they get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, right? And they, and they, they have to weed the garden, right? And they have to fertilize the garden. They don't just, and look at that dirt that the seed is in, whose is that? That's God's too. You can't create dirt. But the farmer has to get out and dig the, the lines in it to put the seed in. And, and, and do you ever go by one of them big fields out in the Midwest where all that corn is and stuff, and they got those big, long metal things on wheels to bring the water to the field, right? Whose water is that? It's God's. But the farmer has to water the stinking plant, right, or it's going to die. But when grown, God's seed, God's person, God grows, but you have to be a partner in that. He's planted the seed in you. The gospel was received. His Holy Spirit lives in you, but you have to grow that thing in partnership with him. I don't understand that dance, but something's going on there, and you're an active participant in growing the seed. And so my question is, what are you doing to grow what God gave you? If you're saved, the gospel's in you. The Holy Spirit's in you. You have the mind of Christ you have the Spirit of Christ, and you have 66 books of explanation. And so what are you doing with that thing that God planted inside of you? How's your prayer life? Mine stinks. I had to admit that to a dear brother and sister yesterday. That's not fun, pastor man. It stinks. The Bible's, listen, some of you may pray. I know some of you do. Here's what the Bible says. Pray for all people, pray for all things, and pray without ceasing. How's that going for you? See, most of us in the room will go, well, I, you know, I pray pretty good, and I'm, I'm not doing that, but he doesn't, he doesn't expect, well, why did he write it then? Is he, what is, he, is he a joke, someone to treat as common? He's, that's what his word says. You're dependent on him to get you into glory someday, right? He said, pray for all people, for all things at all times. How's that going? Are you growing that seed that he gave you? I'm not, not nearly like I should, but I have committed myself afresh to trying to do so. How about your attending? Most faithful church attenders visit their church three times a month. Pathetic. How's your attendance? What example are you setting for the rest of your family or your kids when you just blow off church like it's no big deal? Placing yourself into faith-building environments, right? Where the word of God, where, how does faith increase? By hearing the word of God, right? But yet, people choose not to put themselves into that context. How about this? We're supposed to make disciples, right? Right? That's what the church is called to do. How many of you are seeking out someone to disciple you? Are you waiting for Jesus to come along the beach and say, Peter, come follow me? Or are you seeking out your rabbi? Because the seed has been planted in you, and you want to be a partner with him, to grow it. How many women 
in this church feel as though their faith isn't as strong as it should be and have called someone who's been walking with the Lord for some time and called them and said, disciple me, teach me. How many men in the church are seeking to be discipled by one of their pastors? How many people are calling and saying, hey, preacher, I just, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to grow. I'd like to learn more. I'd like to be used more for the kingdom of God. I want to be a better father for my uh, kids. I want to be a better husband for my wife. You know, help me out with that. Absolutely. Bring your Bible. Let's sit down. My phone doesn't ring. How many people are studying and meditating on God's word? How many people are fasting, making that a, a uh, constant in their life? Putting yourself in faith-building environments and exercising spiritual disciplines in order to grow. The Bible says to give your bodies as a living sacrifice to God for all that he's done for you, that that's your reasonable worship. How's it going with giving your entire life to God? These are not rhetoric. These are supposed to be be the reality of the Christ follower, not the Christ fan. The book of Joshua says that this book of instruction should be studied continually and meditated on day and night so to ensure you will obey everything in it. How's that going for you? How many people are struggling in a sin that won't go away? Anybody else? Awesome honesty in church. Okay, I just read to you something that Almighty God inspired to write. If you're struggling with something, He said, if you will study his word and meditate on it day and night, it will be to ensure, is God a liar? Is he weak and not able to deliver on his promise? He said he will ensure you that you'll be able to do everything that it says. So if you're struggling with these things, get in the word of God daily. Get into faith-building environments where the word of God is preached to you, over you, Constantly, so you can live the life that God wants you to live. Here's a scary thing. The Bible says that if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. You guys have heard me say that. I pounded that nail all the time up in this church, all the time, right? If anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is new. Behold, the new man. Awesome. Woo! I'm in Christ. 1 John 2, 6 says that whoever claims to be in Christ must, how much wiggle room is must? Show me. Show me, right? Must walk as Jesus did. How's that going? See why now I press so hard on you guys about doing what this book says? Because there's going to be a day that you're going to be judged and he's going to say, and you're going to say, Lord, Lord, who are you? Anyone who claims to be in Christ must walk Live as he did. (coughs) Not just the idea of Jesus. Not just the admiring of Jesus because he was so awesome, but actually living as he did. That's what the Bible teaches. How's that going? See, most people want to want the fruit, but they don't want to be the fertilizer. Some people want to play, but they don't want to practice. Some people want the significance, but they won't offer the sacrifice. That's the problem in the church. But the thing is here is that if you'll press in and actually do these things and exercise these spiritual disciplines and let God grow that thing in you that he placed, he can actually use little old you to do really big things. Look what he said, that if this, this plant, the seed that he put inside of you is not just going to become the big, like a big plant. It's not going to become the biggest plant in the garden. It's going to be a tree amongst plants. He can take this little thing that he deposited into you, and you can be something big for his kingdom. That's what he does. He took, what, five loaves of bread and two fish and fed 5,000 people. He took one little flask of oil and he, in that story in the Old Testament, and he used it to fill many, many, not just a few jars of oil. One little, itty-bitty, radical act of Peter's will, obedience. Just one yes. Jesus filled his nets with 150 fish. The same net that had been in the water all stinking day and caught nothing. 
but one radical act of obedience of his will. And God multiplied it into 150 fish. And for those of us that exercise these disciplines of praying constantly and attending faithfully and giving generously week after week after week, you see the multiplication that God promises you in your life. But most people in the church, they're just cool stories. And they're, man, I wish that would happen to me. But you won't do it. You won't buy in. You won't help him grow the seed. Jesus likens the kingdom to the seed becoming a tree, and it's an awesome picture of what you could be. Bring up some of those trees again so they could see it. I want you to put your eyes on it. You see these trees, they're big, and the Bible tells us about this tree. It would be a, it would be a big thing, and that the birds would come and make a nest in its branches. It's a great picture of of. of what you could offer as this seed that's inside of you becomes something big and awesome. And God illustrates to us through his word what you could offer, much like the tree offers for the bird, what can you offer to the rest of the world? Well, I jotted down a couple of things that a tree would offer that you could offer. A tree offers safety, comfort, and shelter. Think about the birds. They go there for those three things, safety, comfort, and shelter. What does that mean for us, though, as people? If we grow this seed and become the tree, this outpost for the kingdom of heaven, what could we be? Well, much like a tree is for the birds, how about family? How about feeling wanted and loved and welcomed and protection and inclusion, community, right? We're not meant to live alone. You know, they have these shows on Discovery or something about these crazy people that live out in Africa by themselves in the middle of nothing. The reason why they're so popular is because that's not a common thing. No matter how much you guys drive me crazy, I can't wait to come back the next week and hang out with you again. Right? I don't know why, but I just love you. But that's the way we're meant to live in community with each other, right? And I was thinking about this, this illustration. I was thinking about, I don't know if you guys ever realized that when I go home from here, I, take, I go down 441, I take a right on 19, like you're going out towards Howie. You know that big, the big water tower out there for, for Tavares? Did you ever look at it at night? It's lit up. And it's like a thousand vultures on that thing. Now, I don't want to say anything good about vultures, but I'm just saying that, the, that that's a little community right there. It's like a tree. It's big. And they all go there every single night. That's where their family's at. That's where they hang out. And that's the way we're supposed to be for, for people. We're supposed to be big and visible and open and provide family and love and wanted and inclusion. That's what a tree does. That's what you could be. It also provides, like, food. It's provision. Think about what a tree does for a bird. Seeds and bugs and berries and fruit and all that stuff, right? It provides for the birds. And, and here's the thing. How does that apply to you? Well, the seed gets inside of you. The gospel takes root, the Holy Spirit indwells, and you start to help him with the watering process and fertilizing, and this thing grows into a tree. And you could provide those things for other people. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 says, Look after one another to ensure that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. You're the tree with the provision. People can come to you when they need something. That's what God wants for you. I want you to do me a favor and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I want you to read something with me. We're talking about growing the tree, right? Here's how you grow the tree. So you, can ha you have the ability to provide for people. While you're turning there, remember this past week we, were doing we had mega millions craziness? You guys remember this, right? It was all over the news. $1.68 billion. You know the Bible doesn't say that you can't gamble. It does say the money easily gained is easily lost, and we're supposed to be a good steward of our money. So if you took all your savings from your family and bought a bunch of Mega Millions tickets, you're a moron. The Bible says that somewhere. But I just want to tell you the truth. Like, I bought a ticket. I haven't bought a lottery ticket in a 1,000 years. But I just like, hey, how cool would that be to, like, have your name attached to the biggest prize in the history of America? That'd be kind of cool. So... I didn't get one number. I think God was trying to tell me something. But here's the thing. I don't know if you played or not. You can figure that all out for yourself if you think it's good or bad. I don't know. Doesn't matter. But 
Have you ever had that conversation about the lotto? What you'd do if you won? Raise your hand if you had that conversation, right? Everyone, I love it. Everyone had that. The list, right? I'd buy myself. Well, you know, I wouldn't. I, I'm just a simple folk, so I just, you know, maybe get a new truck. But bull crap, right? Come on, right? <laughs> it would change. You don't know what 1.6 would do to you, right? So we have these conversations. I had a lot of conversations with people the last week or so about this. Do you ever have that conversation with people, and they always, and, and, and a lot of them will say this, man, if I win, non-believers. Man, I'm going to give a bunch of money to the church. Did you ever hear that one? All the time, right? Yeah, I'm going to, if if I win, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I had a couple people tell me this. Moses, I'm going to give you a, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to buy you a building, and you're going to have, it's going to be the most awesome place, and all that stuff. I'm like, yeah, thanks for the, for the five million out of your 1.6. I appreciate that. Um, no joke, right? But 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 here's the thing. Why we why why do you wait till you have a bunch of money to, to give it towards God's kingdom? What's the deal with that? See, he, he that's not the way you grow the tree. Here's how you grow the tree. You don't wait for the mega millions and then invest into the kingdom. Here's how you do it. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. So here's the thing. In, in a few moments, we're going to take an offering. And, what, and if you haven't been to this church, this may surprise you, but if you come here, you know this is what we do. We take a few minutes, and we give God some space and prayer. And we're like, all right, God, what do you want me to give? I mean, you all think that there's a Holy Spirit, right? I hope you all do because he's real. And he talks to people, and he tells you. And, and you just say, okay, what does it look like to be thankful? What does it look like to partner with you? What does it look like to be generous, Lord? I'm listening. And whatever he puts in your heart, you walk up here and you put it in. That's what this is. You all have to decide. No one should tell you, hey, you need to give 10% or you're going to hell. Like, that's stupid. So we pray because the Bible says to pray about everything. So that doesn't mean everything except money. We pray about it. So we decide, okay, God, what is it? We don't give out of reluctance. We don't give to pressure. We give, why? Because we're cheerful. It says, for God loves a cheerful giver. Watch this. And God will generously provide all you need. Now, here's the tree part. You ready? Then you will always have everything you need. Amen? That's for you. That's your thing. If you give, even today, out of your, out of your poverty, the promise of Almighty God who spoke the worlds into existence said, if you will give according to what I lead you to give, you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others the tree. Do you see that? You be, he, he's going to use you as the outpost of the kingdom of heaven. When people can, if they need anything, they know to come to you. You're the guy. You're the girl who's going to be there for them. And he wants to, God wants to use you as the tree, just like this. He doesn't want you to say, go buy a lottery ticket and then give. No, he wants you to give out of what you've already received from him right now, and then he'll give you more so that you can share with others. You're the tree. Does that make sense? One, per, one person clapped. Awesome. <coughs> here's, the, here's the last thing about the tree. It's a focal point. There's the water tower. No matter where they are, those birds, they just have to look for the tower. They just look for the tower. No matter where, they, if they're in Umatilla, they look for the tower. If they're in Altoona, if they're in Fruitland Park, if they're in Montverde, wherever they are, they just look for the tower because they know that's where home is. That's where my family is. That's where I feel welcome. That's where I feel loved. That's where I feel accepted. That's where I'm supposed to go. The tree that God wants to grow you into from a little old thing to something bigger is a focal point for the, for the environment that you're in. It's a place where people know, hey, that's the God guy at work. That's the God girl at work. She's the one that seems to have an idea, a clue in life. When things happen, she's cool. When things go bad, he's still whistling. He seems to have an answer for things. He never gets too rattled by stuff. So be the God person so that... All the people around you can come and say, you know what? I don't know why, but I think I just need to go talk to Matt. I think, you know, Doug just seems to be that kind of guy. I just need to go. I, you know, when I, have, when I need advice or I need provision, I'm short a few bucks. I need some advice. I need some encouragement. I need some comfort. I need some, someone to even pray for me. I'm, like, not even a Christian, but maybe his God can help me out. 
be that person. Be the God person at work. Become the local outpost for the kingdom of heaven. And corporately, like you've been placed together here, right? You didn't really get to decide all that. God, according to his word, he places us together. So he brought you here. And so corporately, our greatest goal together is that revolution people grow this outpost right here that God has planted. Like envision this place and the small group that we started with. We're, that's the seed. He planted something here. He started something here. But he wants it to become an outpost for his kingdom. So the tree can, should grow and grow and grow as we diligently pray and serve and give and love so that all the people around here, much like the vultures, can know that this place has the light on, that this is the place to go to seek peace and comfort and help and advice and love and welcome and prayer and provision, the light on a hill. All would come here. This is where the safety is. This is where provision is. This is where love is. It's the kingdom of heaven invading earth. That's the church of Jesus Christ. And that's what he's called us to be, a slice of heaven. And it's the opportunity for us to experience God's kingdom reign right here, right now. As Jesus said, let your will be done. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. This is what he was talking about, not just a place to go in for an hour or so on Sunday and go home, but to take this little thing that he started and with him grow this thing huge so it could be used for his kingdom's advancement. That's the church I want to be a part of. Do you want to be a part of that? I mean, really be a part of that. Really be a part of that. Would you just do me a favor? If God spoke to you about anything today, would you just encourage your brothers and sisters? You know, the Bible says we're supposed to not neglect meeting together, but to encourage one another, especially now since the time is short. Would you encourage your brother and sisters in Christ? Would you just, if God spoke to you today, just so they have evidence that God is alive and well and moving, would you just raise your hand? It's so awesome. Praise God. Praise God. I want to pray with you for a moment, and then um, we're going to do what we do, what I just told you about, about our offering. And, um, and we'll do it just like I said, just like I said. But before we do that, I want to let you know that we're going to do one more song. And I know some of you don't like loud. I'm giving you a warning. It's going to be really loud. We're going to sing, and in our praising, we're going to kick everything dark out of this place. Do you understand? Come on now. Ready? We're going to kick out anything that doesn't belong in here in our praise. We're going to shout. It's, gonna, it's our fault. We're going to be singing the Lord's Prayer. Awesome, right? We're going to sing the Lord's Prayer, and we're going we're gonna to sing to him and ask him to send his kingdom right here into our, into our church and into our community and in so doing, we're going to kick out everything that is dark and demonic and awful that could possibly be within our voice. It's got to it's gotta go, okay? That's what we're going to do. So it's going to be loud. So if you need to move away from these speakers, move away. If you want to put on earplugs, put them in. Or if you want to split, you can split, whatever. But we're going to worship our great king with one more song. Did we kill